All right. I'm thrilled to see all these people, live human beings in a space. Um, thank you guys for being here uh, as part of our second more perfect live debate experiment. Um, for those of you who don't know More Perfect, it is a, uh, well, it's, it's Radio Lab's first spinoff. Radio Lab is a show I made uh, about 15 years ago, have continued making. Last year we started uh, More Perfect. And the idea was we would take the sort of Radio Lab vibe and we would apply it to questions that land before the Supreme Court. And this would be sort of our side door way of talking about this crazy ass country that we live in. <laughs> so, uh, with that in mind, speaking of crazy, we're going to talk about the First Amendment tonight. Yeah. Yes, First Amendment enthusiast to my left. Um, the First Amendment, just for context, is a very, it's a crazy thing. It's a very weird, unusual thing. Like, if you look across the world, nobody else really has the kind of First Amendment that we have. I mean, we take it for granted. But it is a very unusual thing. I mean, the text, as you see, says, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. You can see it on the monitors. No law abridging the freedom of speech. It seems so sweeping and so absolute. But the truth is that for about 200-ish years, we have been arguing about what those words mean because Congress clearly can abridge our freedom of speech. They do it all the time. I can't go on TV and say fuck. I just can't. I can't go on Twitter and uh, threaten to assassinate Donald Trump. I do not have the freedom of speech to threaten our president with violence. There is all kinds of ways in which my freedom of speech is constantly being limited. The question for us tonight is, 2017, here we are living in a world where we more and more communicate online, where people behave really badly. Should we tinker with the First Amendment to make it work for us here in 2017? Should governments or someone else, this is, the, this is the question we're gonna start off with, should the government or someone else have the right to take a heavy hand in limiting hateful speech online or fake news? Shouldn't they have that right? So that's our question. And as Jennifer mentioned, we wanna hear from you guys tonight. This is not one of those situations where you sit back and passively let the smart people say things and then just go, hmm, to yourself. If you agree. No, we actually want to hear you. So, so uh, we, want you to, we want to hear you clap. We want to hear you interrupt. We want to hear you boo or hiss or cheer. Whatever you're moved to do, uh, we want to actually hear that. Because we are recording this. We are going to release it in the podcast. So we need you guys to be a vocal participant in this situation that we're creating. So let's just try it out now. Let's just try it just to get a baseline. Um, everybody clear your throats? <clears throat> All right. Everybody who thinks that your right to free speech, especially online, okay, people say some bad things, fine. But your right to free speech should remain pretty much unlimited. Those of you who feel that way, make some noise. All right, you guys are, you guys are thunderous over here. Let's do, one, let's do one more time so I can just get a sort of more accurate. Those of you who don't think it should be limited, go. Okay. Now, those of you on the flip side, those of you who think there should be some clear, hard limits. <laughs> easy, easy. Those of you who think there should be some clear limits on what you can say online, make some noise. <laughs> All right, okay, that gives us a good sense of where we're starting. And that's basically what we're gonna be asking of you guys tonight, is to, to let us know where you're at with stuff. Make, you know, clap, boo, hiss. Raise your hand at any point when these, when these folks are talking. Raise your hand. And I will call on you if I can, if, you, if you've got a comment or a question. Uh, wait for one of the producers with the mics to show up and point it at you. And, uh, and that's how we're going to do it. And again, we're going to put this out in the podcast feed. Facebook people, you can, in the stream, you should see a place where you can leave uh, live comments and questions. Uh, that will go directly to my iPad, which I will have in my hand shortly. And I'll toss those out as, as they come. So OK, let's get things started. Let me. Uh, let me, oh, one very important thing. Uh, there's gonna be some offensive and adult language tonight. It is unavoidable, just saying. All right, so let me introduce our debaters for round one. The question is, should the government limit online free speech? Taking one side of that question is Mr. Ellie Mistal, our legal editor at More Perfect, also an editor at Above the Law, 
a site for legal news. He is on one side of the stage and of the question. On the other, Mr. Ken White, a First Amendment litigator, criminal defense attorney at Brown, White, and Osborne in Los Angeles. He has joined us here from the left coast. He's a former federal prosecutor. He runs the free speech and criminal justice blog, popat.com. Give it up for Ken. All right, let us begin. We'll start with you, Ellie. Uh, just come and give us your basic sort of uh, position. Why, uh, why, why do you think there, is there something wrong with the First Amendment, would you say? Yeah, no, I don't have a problem with the First Amendment. It was a beautiful thing written for white people who wanted to overthrow the government, it's fine. I have a problem with absolutists who want to elevate threats, harassment, and calls for genocide to the level of a sacred right. I do not think that the First Amendment prevents us from, prohibits us from preventing a Nazi from getting a permit to rally any more than I would think that the Second Amendment prevents us from, from having a sociopath not get a gun permit, okay? Absolutism is absolutely wrong on this issue. Okay, Ellie Mistel, strong beginning. Ken, what do you think? Well, I don't know what absolutist Ellie is talking about. The last one I know is Hugo Black, and he died in 1971. We have well-established narrow exceptions to the First Amendment, and they are narrow for a reason. We got them narrowed on the backs of the powerless being suppressed by the powerful. All of the types of restrictions that Ellie would like are ones that have historically been used against communists, against labor protesters, against war protesters, against minorities, and everyone else. The Nazis aren't the ones in danger from the types of restrictions that Ellie is suggesting he'd like. Okay, there are the two basic positions. Let's get the debate started. <laughs> All right, Ellie, start, start us off. Explain why you think that hateful speech, fake news, shouldn't be protected by the First Amendment. Look, at some reason, at some level, we're already done here. Ken just admitted, just agreed, that we already regulate speech at some level. So really, all we're debating about tonight, the only thing that's even up for debate is where we want to draw that line. Ken would draw that line so it protects Nazis. I would draw that line so it protects us from the Nazis. Where do I want that line to be? All right, let's start with a pretty simple example. Fire! Just kidding, there's no actual fire. I'm sure you've all heard that the thing that you can't say is that you can't shout fire in the crowded theater. But actually, under our current laws, I probably can shout what I just shouted. Because our current standard for the protection of free speech is that you can't say things, what is unprotected, are things that, are, that lead to direct incitement of imminent lawless action. That's a very high bar, and that's where we are right now. So I can probably say fire. What I probably can't say is, fire, kill who you must to survive that would probably get me in trouble. But the fire analogy comes from an older standard, older than the one that I just quoted. It comes from Oliver Wendell Holmes, who some of you might have heard of. And his standard, when he used the you can't falsely shout fire in a crowded theater analogy, his standard was false and dangerous. Speech that is false and dangerous is not protected by the Constitution. I think that's where the line is. I think that's an eminently reasonable line. I think that we had 150 years of a free republic with that line. So that's where I, I want the line where dangerous lies are not protected by the Constitution. I don't want the government deciding what's a lie and uh, what's true. May I remind you we are currently led by a president who thinks that global warming is a Chinese hoax to corner the tungsten market. <laughs> and that's why I don't want the government deciding what to suppress based on its decision about what is true or not. Now, Ellie refers to the fire in the crowded theater, Justice Holmes, uh, Justice Holmes' famous quote. Let's remember what he was talking about. He was using that quote, you can't shout fire in a crowded theater, to justify jailing a man who was protesting World War II by handing out flyers suggesting that people resist the draft. That was the clear danger that the government saw. Now, if you don't think that it's plausible that the government would be suppressing the same type of speech now if you gave it the power, if you handed it to them out of fear of Nazis, then just look at what happened after the protests this last year. 
The alt-right and neo-Nazis rose. There were massive protests in response, and our largely Republican-dominated state legislatures leaped into action, and in 17 places, they proposed heavily punitive anti-protest bills, including four charming examples, making it easier for you to get off if you run over a protester in your car. That's what the government does with the power to suppress speech when you let the government decide what's true. I think you just proved that our current First Amendment standard doesn't do bull to actually protect protesters. All it does is protect Nazis. You want to talk about the Oliver Wendell Holmes case, let's talk about where our standard current, our current standard comes from. It's relatively recent, 1969, Brandenburg v. Ohio. Now, what was that case? I said 1969. You probably thought, oh, it was probably like civil rights. And yeah, and they were making it. No, it was for Klansmen. Brandenburg was a Klansman. He was all making Klan statements. Somebody arrested his ass for being a Klansman. He got convicted for being for inciting violence, and the court said, eh, he's just a Klansman. We really need a new standard that protects the right of class Klansmen to threaten black people in 1969. Great, great system we got here. But you see, Ellie, you know that that's not the right case. That's the one that's best for your argument. The right case is 12 years. I think that means this. <laughs> the right case is 12 years earlier. Yates versus United States. 11 people convicted for becoming members of the Communist Party under the theory that some ideas can be punished as clear and present danger, even when there is no imminent advocacy of wrongdoing. Yates built the wall that eventually Brandenburg completed. And Brandenburg, yes, was a bunch of Klansmen in a field who had invited the media to come take pictures of them. Yes. But Yates is the one, Brandenburg's the outlier. Yates is the one that shows how the power is consistently used by the government. Can you explain to me a standard that allows me to stop Klansmen? Because that's what I want. Like, if yes. you can explain to me how I can make Klansmen not stand in the field, then I think we're going to agree more than we disagree. Absolutely. But it's a misnomer to suggest that the First Amendment is here to protect minorities. Are you kidding me? As I said at the beginning, the First Amendment was written to protect white people who wanted to violently overthrow the government. That is still what it's here to protect. The Constitution didn't even think about black people until the 13th Amendment, I think, as it, we all know. And yet all of the cases that you're trying to undermine, almost all of them are about protecting the rights of minorities. Look at something that you may not think is related, Sullivan versus New York, the, uh, the actual malice standard for defamation. A southern sheriff sued because they were running an advertisement in the New York Times criticizing anti-protester violence and trying to raise money for Reverend King. Defamation law is great for me because defamation law, so we all know that you, know, you can't say, you, you can't uh, falsely um, criticize basically in the press, um, even public figures, if, if there is actual, if you really are trying to lie about them, right? And when I look at defamation law, what I see is a whole area of law that we already have where we trust the courts to delineate what's true and what's false. Truth is an absolute defense to defamation. Truth would be an absolute defense to any kind of free speech restriction I want to impose. But if you lie, if you lie, I should be able to get your ass. Wait, I'm, look, I'm glad you made that comparison. Let me just jump in for a second. I want to dig in on that for a second with you, Ellie. You, so, okay, you're saying that you would like to change the standard so that you could... Well, help me understand. So I what would, what would your the standard. That's okay, so, so what would your scary news, for people. How would you... How, what would the standard be? I would revert it to a false and dangerous standard. I would say that if you make a false statement that is also dangerous, you should be subject to government regulation. That speech should not be protected. I can give you an example. Um, the president is a Kenyan. That's false, but that's not particularly dangerous, and so we can let that kind of slide, right? Um, Hillary Clinton is running a pedophile ring out of a pizza shop. <laughs> do not pass go, do not collect $200. That is both false and demonstrably dangerous. But, okay, but, but those, those are two very clear examples, but the, the idea of falseness and danger can get pretty squishy. I mean, like, sure can. Can, you, can I call up an example, if you, if you guys don't mind? So uh, the Daily Stormer, which is a, a, a very popular neo-Nazi site, uh, there was a situation where they basically took a, a, a Jewish woman, uh, a real estate agent, uh, that's, that's the image right there, you can see it on the, on the screens, and they superimposed it on an image of Auschwitz. They published her name, they published her kids, uh, they said hateful things like, we will drive you to suicide, they called for a sort of troll off on her. Is that 
does that qualify for you? And does it qualify for you, Ken? I mean, would you limit that kind of speech? I think a lot of the comments sent to her were true threats. That is, a reasonable person would see them as statements of actual intent to do her harm. I think that some of the speech about her meets the incitement standard, that it's intended to and likely cause imminent lawless action against her. But ideas, however hateful, can't be true or false. Uh, and it's not for the government to regulate whether ideas or opinions are true or false. No, no matter ideas how can't be, no, they are. no, 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 no. That is how we got here. That is how we got into this failed state that is America right now. No, ideas can be true or false. Climate change, real, true idea. Climate change, not real, false idea. We can make these distinctions, and I don't think that we need to. Your standard requires, and I, and I have unfortunately, because I am black on the internet, I have unfortunately had to deal with some true threats, some not true threats, some s trying to wrestle with this issue when I go to the cops to try to ask for protection, trying to wrestle with this issue of what's actually protected speech and what's actually not protected speech. And my problem with the current standard is that it basically waits until they start shooting at me before they stop them. I want to stop them before they start shooting. I want to stop them before they start driving their cars into crowded protesters, because by then it's too late. I want them to stop too, but here's the problem. The people that you were proposing to give this power to already have powers that they're not using. In, Sh in Charlottesville, some recent emails that came out showed that with all these neo-Nazis coming, what the police were asking for data about and intel about were the leftists who were coming to protest, and they were relying on alt-right sites for it. So what I want to know is why, with the history of America being wh what it is, with the power having been used in the past being what it is, what possesses you to think that if you give this broader power to attack speech to the government, it's going to be used the way you want it to be? That's a fair point. I mean, that's, abs that, that's, <laughs> that's absolutely a fair point, right? Like, this government at this time run by these people are not the people who should be giving any more power to, right? I want the power to be more in the courts. I believe that the courts so far, so good, have been the first responders to our current crisis. I think the courts are in a good position to delineate what's true and false. We literally have a trial mechanism to, to figure that out. Um, I think that the courts are in a better position to, um, to adjudicate these issues. Now, But you're taking I, away the power from the courts. The courts are the ones who have set these narrow standards again, with the experience of how censorship has worked in America. The, the courts, courts are the ones who have decided. The courts have set these standards wrong. I want them to change their standards. Well, they it, change their standards all the freaking time. 10 years ago, we didn't have gay marriage. Now we got gay marriage. Great, good job, court. Let's move on to the next thing. Ken, Ken do you think that, I mean, for those, and, and by the way, those of you in, in the audience who've got questions like, have you ever been uh, trolled online? Have you ever trolled someone online? Uh, let's, let's hear from you guys. Just start putting your hands up. But I, Ken, I trolled question. someone during rehearsal. Oh, yeah. did you? <laughs> uh, a question for you. So for, for those of us that, that do find ourselves as, as, for those of us that are black on the internet, for example, and find ourselves the subject of this kind of thing, should we just take it? Should yeah, we just put up with I'm it? That's what I'm saying. I'm not saying that the government should not use the power of the state to punish something is not endorsing that thing or saying it's decent. I think decent people, and particularly people who advocate strong First Amendment protections, need to stand up and condemn uh, this sort of behavior. Take it, no. I think they should take threats very seriously. I think they should report them to the police. And when the police don't respond, I think they should go to their elected officials and make pressure until they do respond. Because there are some threats that people get that are true threats that are outside of First Amendment protection. Gotcha. And Ellie, I have a comment for you from Seth on Facebook. I don't get the fire in a crowded theater point. You should have the right to do this and also deal with the consequences of doing it, meaning you will likely get banned from the theater. Respond. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Seth. So your 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 concept. So if I shout fire in this theater and cause a panic and people get trampled to death, my punishment is that the green space won't invite me back. I would like a little bit more punishment, I guess. I would, like, I would like it to be a much more problematic thing for me to make false and dangerous statements. And this all comes back to, at, at some very fundamental level, my standard, for any of you guys who care about this, my standard is the only standard that's gonna do anything about fake news. 
fake news under Ken Stanek can just flourish and live and destroy our republic from the inside. My standard says if you are spreading false and dangerous lies, if you are, spend, if you are spreading direct mistruths that are also dangerous to people, the government can stop you. Your standard, if you, look, if you're gonna sit here and tell me that you have some standard that doesn't include putting Alex Jones in a Hannibal Lecter mask, then I think your argument is suspect. Ellie, 69% uh, of Republicans recently voted that CNN is more dangerous than white supremacists. That's the context in which you're advocating legal restrictions on fake news. Well, okay. I mean, so, so here's, no, this is an important point. Yeah, go for it. So here's, an, here's, here, here's here, here, I, I don't, again, I understand that argument, but here's why I don't like it. It's not a good argument to me to say, the racists can't be stopped, so we have to work around them. It's not a good argument to me to say that we can't even try to stop the racists, because if we try to stop the racists, they'll beat us. No, if the racists are so powerful, that means we all need to rise up to stop them, and we all need to think more creatively of how to do it. We can't just throw up our hands and be like, I mean, they don't even like CNN, so what are we gonna do? No, oh, that's, I, not, I, that's not enough. I'm all for fighting back, but I don't see fighting back as handing them the weapons to which they can achieve what they want to achieve. We got a question here in the corner. My question is for Ali when you, when you talked about courts being the arbiters of these things. Don't we ultimately, and this may be beyond the scope, but don't we ultimately run into the same problem where we have appointed judges and they're being appointed by the uh, as crazies in charge right now? <laughs> and yeah. wouldn't we ultimately run into the same problem? So I mean, this is, I mean, you're, you're right. They're, 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 that is an issue. But I think courts have so far been very resilient against against falsity, right? The courts, the courts have, a, have an actual process in place to try to determine what's true and what's false. They have an actual process in place to try to determine what's dangerous and what's not. And, and, it, and as we've seen in the actual administration, the courts have been first on the scene. They've been the only branch of government still functioning right now. And so I guess I do have a little bit more, even if you take a justice that I don't like, and there are many of them, right? Um, <laughs> I, I, I find I, I, would, I would not have a problem having a conversation with a Clarence Thomas if he talked. Um, <laughs> because Clarence Thomas and I could at least agree on a set of facts, right? We would disagree about what the conclusion is, but we could at least agree on a set of facts. And I can't do that with Congress. I can't do that with the executive branch. So I can't do that with a cop. So, so if I have to choose which overpowering government authority is going to be my daddy, I'm going to choose the courts. And hey, I agree, but that's because the courts have done such a great job of protecting the freedom of, of speech. Nazis talk. Uh, and because the courts have drawn such an important bright line in all sorts of areas between falsity and ideas, between things that can be defamatory or incitement and ideas and opinions that are merely despicable. We have a question over here on the, on the far side from you, sir. Yes, so before these issues get to the court, someone needs to enforce the law. Who do you, Ellie, um, who would you have do that? Would, and how would you, this ministry of truth, decide what is true? <laughs> ministry of truth? <laughs> I kind of like the ring of that. <laughs> I feel like we need one now. Um, again, when you are under harassment, you, what do you do? You go to your police station and you could say, these people are harassing me, these people <laughs> are threatening me, right? And the police say, mm, not a true threat. Mm, they're just sending you nooses on Facebook. Just turn off Facebook, right? That's what the police, we need to empower the police to be like, oh, write a report, we'll check it out, we'll see what happens. In, in, one, of, in one of my situations on the blog, I had a guy threatening to kidnap my children, right? And the police were like, Pfft. Luckily, I used to work at a law firm, a really nice law firm, blah, blah, blah. I know a guy at the US Attorney's Office, and he made the FBI come in and do something about it, right? Like, I don't see, I don't see why I have to like, have a special connection and know friends and family in order to get actual police to, to try to stop this person from threatening to, to kidnap my children. I agree 100%. Uh, and I think it's uh, the police are not educated enough and are not trained enough and are not supervised enough to take true threats seriously. I think what Ellie refers to was a true threat fitting into an existing First Amendment exception, and I would like to see the police do something about those types of threats. I mean, I think, I think what Ken and I do fundamentally agree about is that there, and like I said, there, 
This debate is simple in terms of what we're really fighting about is the line. Where we agree is that there is a line somewhere, right? Free speech is not an unlimited right. There is a line somewhere, and what we need to do is do a better job of enforcing that line, I would say, against the people who are directly um, threatening others, be they Nazis, white supremacists, or alt-right people on Twitter. A uh, question from uh, Facebook, uh, and this is a question I had while uh, listening to your argument. Uh, this is from Amisha on Facebook. Uh, how would we police fake news uh, or harmful speech? Because one of my questions, just to elaborate on this, is do we police it by its simple falseness or truthness, or does the person have to knowingly be spreading false news in order to, because I say things that are false all the time, unknowingly, uh, is that is that what you're talking about? Yeah, no, I think I think a knowing standard is 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 fair because you know you want to you obviously I'm in the media I make mistakes the mistakes are going to be made um, but I also think that you can you can tell you can have a process where you can attempt to tell whether or not the person is knowingly spreading false news knowingly doing it on purpose and doing it with an understanding or an appreciation that that falsity could lead to dangerous action again ken and i agree there is an incitement um exception to free speech all i'm trying to say is to let's start the clock on that a little bit earlier let's not wait until you, you shouldn't have to you, incitement shouldn't just be what happens five minutes before the gun goes off let's let's bring incitement back to I don't know, two weeks before, a month before, as soon as we can tell that what you are doing is likely, lead, is likely to lead to somebody's death, that's when the government should be able to come in. We see, well, if we're gonna argue about imminence, that's one thing, but, but we're arguing about more than imminence. We're arguing about what types of statements, what types of ideas can be punished as incitement. And the current law is, built over the course of 50 years, that ideas are not incitement. So when the Supreme Court looked at these 11 communists and said, okay, they're members of a group that advocates academically the violent overthrow of the United States government. And what the courts used to say is, okay, you're done, go to jail. Um, but what the court said is simply advocating an idea academically is protected by the First Amendment. When you get to the point of planning a violent action or specifically telling someone, go do something violent, that's when it's concrete enough and where there's not a broad threat to ideas the way there is. Don't give me that, uh, that academically crap though, right? Just, just because Richard Spencer runs around in a suit and a, and a preppy haircut doesn't mean that he's any more academic in his ideas. If the idea is Jews belong in ovens, if the idea is white people are genetically superior and should live in their own separate country, that's enough, that's, that's enough. That is, that, is, that is an idea that we do not have to accept in a free society. It's part of living in a society that we are able to mitigate our individual rights for the greater social good. There is no value in that idea. And when the idea is completely valueless, we have an ability to say, you know what, we're not going to let you say that. I'm gonna but Ellie, that. what about the idea, though, that police deserve to die for what they do to people? What about the idea that this government should be violently overthrown for what it does? I think Those are the ideas right now that are under the most risk from being prosecuted by people who have targets on Black Lives Matter and Antifa. Mm -hmm. Those are the ones that are gonna happen if you expand the range of what is incitement more. No. Let's go, let's go okay. back to this fellow in the back there. Uh, if we can get a mic for you, I believe you had a question, sir. Sir, can you get, uh, yeah. Okay, go for it. Hi, I just had a, a compare and con contrast question. I'm a lawyer from Canada, recently moved to the US. We have a standard uh, that's quite similar, but we have in Canada something that's called hate speech, and I'll read the definition. Uh, so hate speech is the advocacy and incitement of genocide or violence against a particular defined racial, ethnic, gender, sexual, religious, or other identifiable group. That is punishable under the criminal code. There's a famous case called Keekstra about a teacher in our province of Alberta who was a Holocaust denier. He taught Holocaust denial to his students and he was convicted. Tell the uh, man why the Canadian milkshake doesn't bring all the boys to the yard. Tell, hey. <laughs> Were you finished the question? Just wondering if there is an equivalent in the US system and, and what both of you think about that idea. There is not an equivalent in the US system unless you're inciting something imminent, for, imminent harm, there is no prohibition against hate speech. Hate speech can be a true threat, it can be incitement, but only if it satisfies those uh, those particular terms. And there's a good reason for it. It's because that type of thing is 
abused and abusable. You just said it yourself, that it's supposed to be about inciting hatred, but here you, it's been expanded also to say denying the Holocaust, which is a spectacularly stupid thing to do, but we've gone from saying, okay, you can't incite genocide to saying you can't deny genocide. Now, if, you, if you're going to ask me why I think it would be abused, because it is abused and it has been abused. Who heard about Bob Dylan being brought up, uh, accused, and had a legal proceeding, proceeding against him because of a quote he made about how maybe uh, Croats are afraid of Serbs? In is, Rolling just, Stone. is there an outbreak of like, are there like political prisoners in Canada that I don't know about? Is there, is, like, I think they're too polite think, for that, Ellie. I don't but. think Canada and Germany and all the other civilized nations where they have a more stringent um, restriction on, on hate speech have a problem um, with people not being able to express their ideas freely. Of course the they countries do. that have the, a problem with this. Right, uh, the, the the countries that have a problem with this are going way farther than anybody here is suggesting. They were talking about Russia and North Korea and those places. Those are the places where people are 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 arrested for their mere thoughts. That's not happening in Canada, yo. But you know, we can do better. We can do better than Russia, I think. Uh, and uh, yes, take, take Canada England. is doing so. S someone is someone is sentenced to jail for leaving anti-religious uh, pamphlets that offend a uh, minister at an airport. Uh, take France, where again, there's a legal proceeding started against uh, a rock star for suggesting that maybe uh, Croats are afraid of Serbs or vice versa. Uh, any of these places, these things are happening all the time. They don't get a lot of press, but the thing is, they chill speech. And those places are right now in a better place than we are in terms of whether or not they should be afraid of their government. Let me they, just, I, just, I, I want to pick up on chill speech. Though. Okay. Go for it. They chill speech. That is always the argument from the First Amendment crowd, they, that if you have more restrictions, they chill speech. Let me tell you something about being a minority in this country. Every minority in this country knows that if they stand up and speak and say anything, they are liable to be harassed or threatened or shot. Free speech did not catch a bullet in Memphis. Martin Luther King caught a bullet in Memphis. So the free speech that you talk about is already denied for many minorities and others and, and kinds of others people in this country. All I'm trying to do is bring the white man down to the rest of our level, right? Why should, the, why should the white man have this protection of speech that just does not extend to anybody else? And you think that this system that has produced such injustice, given more power, will now, after all these years under this regime, produce justice? All right, but let, let me just, okay. That, I'd rather have this debate in 2020. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a date. <laughs> All right, now you've heard uh, Ellie and Ken's points. The question is, did you change your mind? Is what we want to know. So let's take a poll again. People watching on Facebook, take our poll. You should see it in your stream right now. Who thinks the government should limit what we say online? Okay, that's for Facebook. Folks here in the audience, same question. Who thinks we should limit what we say online? Let's hear some noise. Let me, uh, g those of you who actually leaned farther in that direction over the course of this argument, let me hear from you guys. You, claps. you got a few, Golf you got a few. Uh, those of you who do not think there should be limits placed from the government by us online, let's hear it. Uh, I think we may have a winner for the first round. Uh, I'm going to declare that you, Ken White, are the winner for the first round. Give it up for Ken White, First Amendment attorney, former federal prosecutor and founder of Popat.com. Thank you for joining us, Ken. All right, we have more. We have more. I think, uh, given, given our time, we should just hop into round two. How are we all doing? Well, good? Did we enjoy the debate and the cocktails? Okay, so round two, we're gonna take that same basic question that we asked in round one, but now we're gonna transpose it. As opposed to the government, should the government limit or not limit hate speech and fake news online? Let's ask that same question about Twitter and about Facebook. Um, whatever we think about the First Amendment, it does place limits on the government, but not so much on Twitter or Facebook. So the question is, 
Should Twitter and Facebook or other social uh, media companies severely limit online speech? No. <laughs> or shouldn't they? Uh, here, well, that's, that's, that's a very good question. I'm going to leave it to our uh, debaters to do that. I, I want to po poll you guys first, just again, so we have a, uh, a baseline to start from. Those of you, people watching on Facebook, sh do you think the site of which you are on right now should aggressively <laughs> limit the speech that you might type? Uh, take, take the online poll. Those of you in the audience, same question. Uh, should Facebook and Twitter be allowed to l severely limit online speech? Define it as you will. Okay, those of you who think, hell no, Twitter. <laughs> All right, that's, I guess, I get a kind of a sort of mixed sense of where we're at in the audience. Okay, so here to debate this topic with Ellie is Corinne McSherry, legal director of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which is committed to defending civil liberties in a digital word world. Give it up for her. <laughs> All right, so. Corinne, let's start with you. What, what do you think about the prospect of a Twitter or a Facebook stepping in to take down lies and take down hate speech? So I, I think it's a very dangerous path that unfortunately we're already well along. I think in moments of crisis, and I think we're in a moment of crisis right now, we look to simple solutions for very complex problems and we are often sorry. And I think that is where we are right now. The internet grew up the way it did for mostly good, I would argue, because the platforms and the intermediaries mostly stayed neutral. That's what helps, the fact that they didn't decide to be decision makers about what speech was valuable and what speech wasn't made it possible for so many platforms to emerge, for people to organize, for people to speak politically, for people to find community that didn't exist before, including anonymous communities where they would have been too scared to speak up. If we have a world in which Facebook, Twitter, Google, Instagram is gonna take, put themselves in the position of a court and decide what speech should be up, what speech shouldn't, we're gonna walk down a dangerous path because those decisions, those tactics will inevitably be used against speech that we would support, for one thing. They will be inevitably used eventually by governments. Private censorship does not stay private. It becomes public censorship almost inevitably, and the third reason is really practical. They're already doing it, and they're doing it badly. All kinds of lawful speech is being taken down every day. Google and Facebook can't save us from the Nazis. We have to do it. Okay, thank you, Corinne. Ellie, what do you think? Yeah, the First Amendment does not apply to Twitter or Facebook. Anybody who tells you that they have a constitutional right to say what they want on Twitter is an idiot. The Twitter trolls want, they don't just want free speech. They want consequence free speech. They want to be able to say their vile trash and still keep their jobs and still keep their homes and still get the girl. Screw these people, all right? We should have Twitter at least at the level of a Jets game. <laughs> all right. Those are the basic sides. Uh, let's start the debate. All right, Corinne, kick us off. Okay, so the problems here are legion, and I'm gonna start with the ones that I, that I just touched on briefly before. The reality is that we can all target people that we hate right now, but if we think that the rules that Twitter and Facebook and all those guys are gonna come up with aren't gonna be used against speech that we support, we are foolish. It's already happening. Community standards complaints are used against valuable speech all the time. I know because I hear about it every day in my job. Then the related problem to that is when you get your lawful speech taken down, you don't have any options. You don't know how to get your stuff taken, put back up. So we have courts, but we don't have a right of appeal. We don't have any challenge. I mean, and it's quite right. These platforms have the right to host any speech they want. They have the right, they don't have, they actually have the First Amendment right to host any speech they want. But I think as users, we want them to use that right wisely. That's not happening right now. No, as a user, I want them to stop Nazis. Oh, That's see, really all I'm concerned about. Yeah, I want they, them to find a Nazi and stop them from, expre from expressing their hateful views on Twitter. But that is a dream that you're having. On Twitter. They can't, they can't, yes. that's foolish. No, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> 
The notion Are you a Nazi? Could, yes. Goodbye. Here's why. Done. They, you know why I know they can't? Because they're trying and they're failing over and over. They cannot tell the difference between hate speech and reporting on hate speech. And so accounts get taken down and suspended when they're doing perfectly lawful Things. One it of the real the one time. of one of the reasons why this is so important that we we demand better from Facebook, from Twitter, from Reddit is that the reason why we're seeing so many more Nazis now is because these platforms have allowed them to organize by having again this absolutist free speech level. They've actually allowed these Nazis to come together in private and organize and multiply and infect the rest of our society. There was a reason why the Klan was on the decline 20 years ago. Because, you, because wearing a hood and going out to meet your friends in the middle of a field, like Brandenburg did, wasn't really how the modern society was going. But then Twitter and Facebook and these sites and Reddit came along, and now they have a way to talk and talk to each other and realize that, no, I actually hate black people too. Oh, so do I. Yeah, let's hang out. No, screw these people. There's no, there's no constitutional reason why Twitter should allow them to exist or Facebook or whatever. There's no business reason why Twitter or Facebook or whatever should allow these people to exist. Get them the F out. Car so, Karen, let, let me go back to, uh, if I can pull you back to something you were saying. Yeah. Uh, you say that uh, it's really, they're trying and they're failing and we should look at the failures. Because, uh, you know, one of, one of the things I think about is, it, one of the things we heard uh, in the wake of Charlottesville was that a lot of these folks got radicalized online. So why would the prospect of them getting radicalized online, what would balance that out in terms of the failure that these sites are doing? I'm curious to hear you talk more about that. Okay, so a couple things. I do just want to respond to this real quick. Sure. My view is if white supremacists, supremacists and Klansmen and Nazis are organizing, I way prefer they were doing it out in public where I can see them and I can challenge them and I can respond to them. And law enforcement will say the exact same thing. People who fight terrorism say it's much better for the for the you know the people to speaking publicly for the radicals to be radicalizing where you can see them, not in secret. Because you nope, think just because nope. it don't want to see racist, in secret, no, thank you. Don't They're going to organize anyway, okay? So would you rather do it, they do it in secret or in the open? I, I prefer rather, the I would, open. I would rather them do it in secret. I would actually rather them go and find and make their own Nazi website, right? Make their own Nazi thing, right? So that when... I, whenever I get Ken to agree with me, whenever the government is ready to stop these people, they will have all pre-registered. They would have all said, hey, look at us. Yeah, We're here on NaziMeet.com. Boom, and we can go get them. And so great. So we can continue the silo conversations that we're having right now, which is a big part of where yes, I would like up to be siloed from Nazis. Yes. I think that's that, that sounds very nice and it's a good talking point. But in reality, I think that's very, very dangerous for our society. We need people to be talking to each other when they only talk to people who agree with them. They never change their minds. Now, to your point, that sorry, I didn't mean to agree with That has proven time and time again to me not true. And again, I, hate, I, 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 I feel like that is such a, a happy, clappy, white version of this story. Oh, if we just talk to these people, we can convince them that maybe black people shouldn't be set, sent off to yeah. prison camps. Once or twice. Do you and know the rest why, of the time, they're running cars into people. Do you know it why doesn't we, happen nearly not long enough. Do you know why we have gay marriage equality now? Because people talk to each other. <laughs> the only reason, but it helped. But I want to answer Jad's question, if you let me. I think we me. have gay marriage calling me Thank because you. gay people took to the streets and demanded their rights. And that also. But that by itself didn't do it. But I still want to get back to the question because I think what you're asking is for an example of why I'm worried about how the moderation happens. Yeah, I want to gauge your happens. worry against Ellie's worry. Yeah, okay. So the way that it works now and the way that it's likely to continue to work is that so the social media companies employ a combination of humans and mostly algorithms to try to figure out what's bad speech and what's good speech. And they f mess it up, um, to say politely. So for example, they're trying to flag hate speech via an algorithm, and so they'll end up taking down uh, a terrible, uh, yeah. So they'll end up taking down this statement, all white people are racist, as an example of hate speech, but they won't take down you might show the previous one, this from a congressman who said, I can't read it quite, sorry, not a single radic radicalized Islamic su suspect should be granted any measure of quarter, et cetera, et cetera. Nasty stuff, right? They can't tell the difference. And that's what happens. And there's a hat tip to ProPublica. I hope you guys are all ProPublica supporters and fans because they're great. They did a detailed study to look at Facebook's policies. And they found out that, among other things, they're training their moderators to, in some instances, protect white men over black children. 
Yes. That's I, where we are right now. That's what we want to endorse? That's what we want to encourage? I don't think so. I will stipulate that there are many examples of these private companies, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, whatever. I will stipulate that there are many examples of, of them getting it wrong. They get it wrong. They're not great at this job yet. But we live in a real world where the actual, now I'm talking about Twitter cops, but we live in a world where the actual cops get it wrong every freaking day. They get it deadly wrong every freaking day. And in my most radical statements, I'm not saying let's get rid of the cops because they don't know what they're doing. No, I'm saying let's get better cops. And for Twitter, I'm saying let's get better <laughs> Twitter cops so they don't get it wrong so, so many times. But you want to talk about letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. Just because Twitter and Facebook have not gotten to the level yet where they're able to effectively police these people doesn't mean they should just stop trying. So let's talk about what we're talking about here. When you talk about the enemy being the perfect of a good, Thou oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> They're like the perfect the enemy of the good. At any rate, what we have, where we are right now, is thousands of accounts are being suspended every day. Let's just say a relatively small percentage of those are for per perfectly lawful speech. That's a lot of lawful speech. That's oh. a lot that we have authorized Twitter and Facebook and everyone else to take down and encourage them to. And keep in mind, I want to say one more thing that I said before, but I want to emphasize it. Once we start down this path, if you think that this is going to stay within the decisions, the, the, the decision makers at Silicon Valley, you are dreaming. I mean, that's bad enough. I'm not actually sure why we all want Silicon Valley to make decisions about what speech is OK for all the rest of us. But even that aside, it's not going to stop there. Governments are going to come in when they see that Google, Facebook, Twitter can easily take down accounts. They're going to say, OK, could you do that for us? And we're going to hear from China, and we're going to hear from Vietnam, and we're going to hear from Thailand. Is, is this that, right. doesn't stop. Government should regulate speech. No, government can't regulate speech. OK, Twitter should regulate speech. No, if Twitter regulates it, the government will. Somebody needs to stop these people. And I refuse to believe that we live in a country where that is impossible. OK, yes, other governments coming in in China and Russia and blah, that's a problem. I I'm, I'm, can't deny it. That's obviously an issue. But again, you are conflating people. You are conflating the people who actually do bad stuff, Nazis, with the people who need protection from the bad stuff. I'm not conflating them. Twitter is. Let's, uh, let's get a question on the far right side of the, uh, of the audience there. Hi. Um, I just wanted to go back to that part where if the al algorithms can be changed and algorithms can get more perfect, um, yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah. um, but so let's say I'm we impressed. Silicon Valley. I want to support that. Let's say we get there, uh, or just at least pretty close to it. Um, would that change your argument or your views towards you know protecting people? Because it's a tangible problem that has implications. If you're coming from from a place where you're a minority, or if you're someone from a class of people who are not currently protected on this, because I've had friends who had a lot of rape threats over Facebook and Twitter. So it really does matter that Facebook changes its algorithms and takes that down. So yeah. Answer the technocrat. If I thought that it was possible for Facebook to develop an algorithm that actually would accomplish, would never take down lawful speech, I'd be pretty happy about that. I would still be worried, because I would still be worried about who defines what counts as hate speech and what doesn't count as hate speech. And that is, in fact, why it makes it so hard. To, to develop that kind of algorithm. It's just, not, it's just not easy. It's not even easy also when you train humans. I mean, you can't train computers, you can't train humans. Well, no, you go Corinne, I mean, it's, I mean uh, let's just use a dumb example. I mean, th there was a time when Siri understood nothing I said. And now she understands, if I can call her she, she understands 60% of what I say. So, I mean, is it an all or nothing thing? I mean, might these things get better that we can actually? But, but we consider what we're talking about. Right. This is this is a different kind of thing. It's not what what my shopping list is this week. It's whether or not you advocate for the destruction of an entire race. That's what we're talking about. So if you ever use the word Facebook, the AI, or sorry, the word genocide, Facebook should be trained to take you down. No matter no, what the context. We can get the no, you need the context. To put, the, to put it in the context, look, I have some personal experience with this because on the blog that I write um, above the law, we used to have open comments. We used to anybody just go and say your crap. Um, and it was good, it was good for the site, it was good for, it was good for our business. At some point, as our site got bigger, um, and as we brought on more female writers, more female full-time staff, um, the kinds of disgusting comments they got 
began to completely overwhelm any possible value of having open, open unmoderated comments. We run a small site, we're leanly staffed. We didn't have the staff to moderate the comments um, in real time, and so we eventually decided just to shut them down. We had to decide to live in an all or nothing world. I would like to, I would have liked to, have, be able to afford the kind of staff that it would take to actually moderate those comments, a real human. Now again, we're a small site. Twitter can afford the real humans. So they can af Facebook can afford the real humans. Instagram can afford the real humans necessary to sit there and put some of these things in context and get rid of as much as they can. Are they gonna get rid of all of it? No. Is it gonna be perfect? No. Will it stop a non-zero portion of this crap? Yes, so let's go do it. Let's take a, question, uh, take a question here in the back. Uh, if Facebook emailed you and said, you can be in charge of what's considered you know, speech that is either left up or is taken down, you could build you know, whatever team of people, would you accept that? Would you think that that could create something that you would be satisfied with or not satisfied with? Oh, if I was queen of the world. <laughs> Um, it's hard to turn that down, <laughs> but I think even I would have trouble in all instances being perfect about what was um, lawful speech and what wasn't speech, but that actually isn't my main concern. It's that even I could then potentially be, suffer, um, be required by a government to then use that algorithm for other purposes, and that would be really dangerous. But here's the one thing that I would say, and this is where I think we agree, is that if I was queen of the world and I was running any of these companies, one of the things I would absolutely do is put in much better processes for people to appeal, for people to challenge when things are taken down wrong. This isn't just a speech issue, it's a due process issue, because let's face it, of course these aren't you know, official government forums, we all understand that, but nonetheless, this is how we talk to each other. This is this, these are our public spaces. And in those public spaces, it's really important when your account gets suspended, when you get taken offline, to be able to get back up if what you're doing is perfectly legal. And right now, the reality is, and I know this because I hear from people all the time, it's very confusing. You don't know who to appeal to. You don't know who to. You don't know why you're taken down half the time, and you don't know what to do. And so all of these companies need to do much, much better. At you know, if they're going to act I, like I a judge and jury, then the, they better the, have an appeal process. There, we, there, we need we need better processes. The, Nothing is, is served by Twitter and Facebook and all these people doing it in secret. So we need more transparent process. Let's, uh, let's take a question on the far right. Hi. Uh, I just wanted to get your opinions on um, money because I hear a lot of talk about this being a, a speech issue or not, but I think for platforms, these social media platforms, I think it's really all about money and it's about followers and young kids that are getting rape threats and um, threats and that they eventually end in suicide, I think that this has to do with money. I think there's a bigger issue here. And I just don't hear anyone talking about it, and I just wanted to know what you both thought about that. Mm -hmm. Well, obviously, I think that there's no legal reason, there's no moral reason, and there's no business reason um, for these sites to allow these people to go unchecked. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I think that that's, that's really a, a real pressure point, because I think a lot of these companies, and I think actually genuinely so, feel uncomfortable making money from from hate, you know, they, they're people. They don't oh, want to I be, don't. They, no, stop. <laughs> Many people don't. Um, but this, but unfortunately, we still have a problem. And I'm going to give you an example from an article I just read yesterday. Um, it's a conversation, it's a, it's a long piece about Google and how it runs advertising and search and so on from Talking Points Memo. And Talking Points Memo mentioned that, you know, one of the problems that they have because these processes are so opaque, they survive because of Google advertising. Them too, right? And they're a legitimate site trying to do good for the world. They survive because of Google advertising. They keep getting penalized for hate speech because they're reporting on hate speech, specifically Dylan, the Dylan Roof situation. So we all it's agree not that the robots easy are... to sort of disentangle. But no, it is, because we agree that the robots are bad, but I think that we can all agree that Talking Points Memo is a decent site. Um, Infowars, on the other hand, if Google and Facebook and whatever slam them, wh who, why, would that, why would that be so hard? Here's, here's, here's the other thing. If you really don't think that we yet have the technology and the resources necessary in order to police these sites better, how about we go the other direction? How about we just out people? How about you just, if you, if you're gonna, if you Twitter are gonna tell me you can't tell who's threatening to kill me, 
Just tell me who it is. Just tell me who it is, and I will handle it myself. <laughs> What's wrong with that? See, now he's just trying to piss me off. Okay. <laughs> So what we're talking about is now a step further. It's social media companies and intermediaries, by the way, all the different people that you interact with, they take it upon themselves to out you, right? To pierce your anonymity. That is profoundly, profoundly dangerous. Anonymity, anonymous speech, is the most, probably the most important form of political speech that we have. The ability to speak, especially online, without fear of retaliation means that you have the ability to speak your truth. If we out people, if we accept that social media companies should be judge and jury over that, should just expose people to the world without any choice, without any recourse, because once you're outed, Yes, right. because the There's thing no that we used to have as a society to protect ourselves from these be people was called shame. We could shame them into being part of the herd. And if they didn't want to be part of the herd, we could know who they are and say, hey, guess what? You're no longer part of the herd. Shame is a powerful weapon that we used to have, and Twitter has taken, away, yeah. taken it away from us. That and that is why these people are allowed to multiply. That weapon was also used to persecute minorities all over the... And, and, Everything was and, always used to persecute minorities. It's still at used to persecute minorities. The fact that I'm something sure has been used to persecute minorities doesn't mean that it can't also be used to stop Nazis. That's just a... Clocks were used to persecute minorities like, when they weren't paid by the hour. The all one right? But thing clocks we are have, still a good thing. The one thing we have always understood in this country, and this is before the First Amendment, is the importance of anonymous speech. Our founders published anonymously. Thomas Paine published anonymously. Violent you know who really government. cares Violent about, the do you know Violent who really the cared about anonymous speech? The NAACP. You know who else thought it was important for be able to, people to be able to organize anonymously? Pete Seeger, when he went and testified before Congress in the McCarthy area, anonymous Speech and association is crucial to our politics. We must not lose it. Actually, most of the people in the civil rights movement felt it was important for them to be open with who they are. That's why we know Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and R Richard Abernathy and John Lewis, because when they were going to do good work, they put their name on their paper, which, is what, we used to, which is what we all should have learned in grade school. So why is it that the NAACP went to court to defend their right to protect the anonymity of their neighbors. Because Klansmen? Their members. <laughs> because, because of the problem with the first part of the argument? Oh, because the Klansmen that we're persecuting Klansmen? them? It's like, it's, it's, all, it's all connected. If we stop Klansmen, then we're fine. If we don't stop Klansmen, then we have to go through all this other thing to try to stop Klansmen. I think that we should just go after the Klansmen. All right, let me just jump in for a second. We have a, we have a question here on the right. I also want to update the audience on our Facebook poll. Uh, the question from the last round was, should we be able to say whatever we want online? The answer, most people thought yes. Free thoughts equal free society. So those of you who said yes, you agree Wait, with Facebook. Let me get this straight. People online thought that they should be able to say whatever they wanted online? <laughs> truth, truth. Let's go to a question on the Roll right me side over there. With this stick. El, uh, Do we Ellie, have a Ellie, I just want to say that I'm not on your side and you are like really, you're doing a great job. I'm liking everything. <laughs> like you're thoroughly entertaining and you're really making me think. I just wanted to say that like um, someone said something about is there a moral reason? that Twitter or the government <laughs> should uh, lean towards free speech. And I personally am someone who used to have abhorrent views. And I was raised as fundamental a Christian as you could get. And my views about gay people, had I spoken them on the internet, probably would have put off some hate speech alarms. And it was not shaming that changed my mind. I encountered people who were engaging, who treated me like a person, even though had back then there been Twitter, I would have been a troll. And it changed my mind. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Westboro Baptist Church. They fought a, a Supreme Court case and won. They have really the worst views of anyone, uh, I, any group that considers himself Christian that I can think of. And their person who ran their Twitter is a friend of mine, Megan Phelps Roper. She has this great story about how using Twitter to essentially like spread terrible hate speech, saying things like, thank God for AIDS for killing gay people. But it was through Twitter and through the arguments she got in and then through the relationships that she got in that she found a way out of that bubble she lived in and now is out in the world doing amazing work. If, if what you want, Ellie, happens, 
that troll that you want to shut up, that clansman you want to get rid of, he doesn't go away. The, the, the mold grows in the shadow and it's, it's only in the sunshine. You know, it's only, I, it's only when you get it out in the open and we have these conversations. And like, as I, a former believer in some of this stuff, like don't lose heart. Like we can have our minds changed and like we can, we can be convinced of the truth. I, <clears throat> I respect your story and I'm very glad that, some, that you were able to, to, to get to where you are. Um, however, <laughs> turns out that I believed what you want me to believe for a good, oh, I don't know, 28, 29 years of my life. I am a 40-year-old black man. I am sick of being the educational PBS after-school special for racist white people. Gay people are sick of being the ABC after-school special for white people. Women are sick of being the after-school special trying to teach the white man why they also should have rights. It is simply no longer acceptable for you to expect other people just trying to go about posting their dinner recipes on Facebook just trying to go about posting their new car smell on Facebook. It's ridiculous for you to think that we should still have the burden of educating you. You should go get educated somewhere. That can't be on us all the time. Now I'm willing to do it. I'm willing to do it here. I'm willing to, I'm willing to do it in, 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 in public. I am actually, I'm willing to go to a bar and have a drink with people that I can't stand. But at some point, when I just want to like get on Facebook and see the Mets score, I shouldn't have to hear your bullshit. Okay, but I don't actually think that was what he was saying at, uh, at, at all. It's entirely possible. Someone should say that with a microphone. I, can't know. I think he was just saying Silo's bad. But, uh, yeah, stick with si that. but that's what okay. I'm saying. Sil that, yeah, that is what he was saying. Silos are bad. We should all be together. And then, then, then. no, I think that. No, I think he's I saying think if we don't talk to each other, nobody's mind ever changes. Elliot, Elliot, I want to cut you off. I've got a question here in the back. Um, I wanted to go back. Can you hear me? Oh, I wanted to go back to the subject of anonymity and the internet, and I see the point that it's very important because you know the Arab Spring wouldn't have happened without Twitter. But um, how can you speak to like more anonymous messaging groups like Yik Yak and how that has had such a negative effect on? college campuses in which there's been so much hateful anonymous speech that has been targeted towards students of color and how they felt very, you know, isolated and afraid and there's no really such such recourse for them in that situation. Yeah, I can actually speak directly to that situation because EFF's had been, been involved in trying to think about it and respond to it directly. And what we have heard from student groups, because there are universities who are trying to crack down on Yik Yak. And what we have heard from student groups on campus is that yes, Yik Yak in particular is has been the source of a, of a lot of hate speech, you know, to be honest. Um, it's also true that they're very afraid that university responses that attempt to interfere with their ability to organize politically and anonymously are going to be a real problem for, the, for students' ability to actually fight back against the hate. So it's, it's just not simple. And I think it comes back to what I said from the beginning. I feel like we're looking for simple solutions to complex problems. It doesn't work that way. So, so but I'm very hate sympathetic is there with on the on the thing. And in order and we can't do anything about the hate. So in order to combat the hate, we also have to all let other people be anonymous to combat the hate that probably wouldn't be happening if those people weren't allowed to be anonymous. See, but the question is what's the price? Right? So you're going to say that you can, that students can't speak anonymously or you're going to say they can't speak anonymously on this one app or what's the where you're going to draw the line because if if you're going to say that students can't speak anonymously to each other, you're going to cause way more harm than They right. can absolutely speak anonymously to each other. It's called a bar. That's where it happened <laughs> for hundreds of years. They can go to the bar. I can go I to the bar after this thing and say whatever I want about whoever I want and not lose my job. I say it on Facebook and I have to think, hmm, my boss might read that. What should happen? Maybe I should, look, if you have something that you want to say and you're not sure if you're allowed to say it, in front of everybody without people knowing who you are, maybe that's a good indication that your idea is crap. Or maybe it's a good indication that your society and your community is crap and needs to change. Mm. Well, let's and grab I don't a... know what bars you go to, but I usually introduce myself to the people I'm talking to. <laughs> but, you know. Let's grab a question That's from the uh, far right side. 
Um, we're talking about such uh, binary solutions, on or off, speech, you know, banned, speech allowed. I mean, there are a lot of like fuzzier ways of handling the problem, right? Like, uh, like forum moderation, right? Like people vote a comment up or down and it kind of shitty comments get buried, right? Dude, Google I'm just can... trying to get these people to acknowledge that there's a problem, okay? <laughs> if, no. we can, uh, if we can just agree that these people should not be left unchecked, then I'm really open to like your idea or somebody else's idea about how to check them. Okay. I, am, I am agnostic into how to check them. What I am not agnostic about is whether or not they should be stopped. Well, well this is kind I was of pretty a, sure that's not what I heard, but okay. This is kind of a middle ground, right? Because you're not actually removing the speech, right? You're, you're just kind of pushing it down a little bit, right? So Google results can be ranked lower or, you know, in, a, in your Facebook feed, maybe it doesn't show up or, you know, it's still all there. I'm just wondering what you guys think of those kinds of solutions that are yeah. kind so of gray actually, area. Uh, yeah, I think that there are a lot of sort of community-based solutions that can work. They are imperfect also, but they can work. What we're, I'm a lot less worried about those that are sort of more, a little more bottom up than the ones that are purely top down where like three guys in Silicon Valley decide what hate speech is for everybody else. That's the, that's the really scary version. The community-based ones, the bottom up ones where people kind of come together and say, hey, we're not cool with this here. Actually, I think that's sort of what, what we should be doing, right? That means you are responding directly to people and you're letting them know, I'm not okay with what you're saying. I think there's too much, I think, I think there's a group of people who think that rape jokes are cool and being racist is cool and that is, and they will go find that and upvote it or, or do whatever they have to do to make sure that that content is seen more highly. I play, occasionally I play online video games and if you've listened to any of the reports, online video games have been a key way that the white supremacists have been recruiting uh, new people because they go online and they're playing their Call of Duty or, or whatever and while they're shooting you in the face, they think it's really funny to say horribly offensive things while they're, while they're shooting you. And I'm not saying that every single 15-year-old white person who's called me the N-word while teabagging me is a racist. <laughs> I am very bad at the game. I mean, I understand <laughs> that there's, you know, I, I deserve it at some level, right? But, <laughs> uh, but the, you have to remember that some of this speech is coming from, and again, because we don't have shame anymore, some of this speech is just coming from people who think it's cool and, 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 and un-PC and rebellious um, to make fun of other people for who they are, right? So I don't think downvoting is the way to go. I think shaming these people and letting them know that this is not, this, this behavior will be frowned upon in this establishment but are you, is the way to go. Are you okay with shaming that doesn't involve piercing anonymity? Because I don't think these are the same things. I think if in a community you respond to someone with a pseudonym, uh, they're speaking under a pseudonym, you're saying, this is not cool what you were saying, is very different from outing that person who, or getting into the habit of outing people who may live in communities where they're saying things that they're afraid to say. Now, it's easy, it's easy to say, oh, but what you said was hateful, and so I don't care if your community shames you. But again, what precedent are we setting when we're going to let uh, a company make a decision probably not knowing very much about the context, about what kind of speech deserves to be outed and what doesn't. All right, I'm gonna jump in now. I think, uh, I think Ellie and Corinne have done all they can to persuade you guys. <laughs> um, it's time for the audience to vote. People aren't watching us on Facebook. Who thinks Facebook, Google, and Twitter, and such are our last hope for maintaining some level of decency and online communication? Please vote. You should see that on your screen. Click the link and vote. Those of you here in the audience, more or less the same question. Who thinks Facebook, Google, and Twitter are our last hope for maintaining some level of decency in online communication? Make some noise. Okay. Yeah, it's a weird phrasing, I know, I know. As it was, as are we it was not coming doing out of my anymore? mouth, I, I thought that's, this isn't working. Um, all right, well, let's see. Let me, let me go back to the original question, which will help us decide a winner. Uh, who thinks that Twitter and Facebook and such should take a strong hand in severely limiting online speech? Those of you who think so, clap. Those of you who disagree with the asshole clapping to your left, make some noise. I believe that means that you are the victor. No, the internet wins. The in <laughs> Please give it up for our debaters, Ellie Mistel, legal editor of Above the Law and More Perfect, 
uh, Corinne McSherry from the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, thank you guys, all of you, for coming. Don't leave just yet. I have some credits to read, and also the bar will remain open. Thank you to Susie Lechtenberg, Elaine Chen, and the Green Space folks for helping us do this. Uh, we'd like to acknowledge the Joyce Foundation for its leadership support of More Perfect. Season two of the podcast is imminent. It is a mere few weeks away. Please check iTunes daily, hourly, until it shows up, even though it won't be for three weeks. And uh, if you have any, as, as uh, Corinne mentioned, if you have any experience with Facebook's policing of hate speech, um, and if you had something taken down or reported, tell the folks at ProPublica, they're trying to figure out how Facebook's policies really work. One of the things is, because they're a private company, it's hard to know. So you can go to ProPublica's Facebook, story, uh, Facebook page to share your story. And I believe that may be it. The bar is still open, and we'll be sticking around for a bit, so please feel free to hang out and talk to us. Thank you, guys.